Already this morning, I had a great revelation about how much more I'm learning from Upadesh Sai. The first time I learned it was in 1997 at a winter camp when Brahmachari Someshwar taught us, who is now Swami Ishwar. So he taught us in Palm Springs. And I was that student at that time, at the end of the uh, camp, I thanked Swamiji, you know, just in a very commercial way, you know, I shook, went up and shook his head and I said, you know, thank you, Brahmacharya I learned so much, this was great, and I, I speak on behalf of all of us, and everyone looked to me like, who, who is this person? But I appreciated it so much. And then when we studied it in the Vedanta course, it was a brand new text. Then I taught it in Pittsburgh, new again. Calgary, new again. And now it's brand new again. So that's Swatthaya, study, 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 over and over again. Vidya Dadati Vinay. The more one knows, the more humble one becomes. The more one knows, the more one realizes that they don't know. That's why I don't walk around saying, I know who they are, you know, done, I'm never going to pick up that book again. I know not even one shloka of Upadeshara. Every time I need to study it again to be able to bring that into my life. Swadhyaya. And the fifth of the niyamas is Ishvara Prani, Prani Nidhana. Pranidhana. Ishvara Pranidhana. Offering oneself to Ishvara. Yesterday we studied the Namada Bhakti. And the last one is Atma Nivedana. Offering oneself. Same message here. Offer oneself to the Lord. As I said, my two favorite of these yamas and yamas is Aparigraha and Santosha. Not having what one doesn't need. And being content with, one, which, with what one has. A problem which most of our parents have specific to Indian parents is that they're pack rats. <laughs> they cannot throw things away. They keep everything. Thinking that next year they'll use it. Next year they'll use it. You know, some of the mothers buy jewelry, oh it's for your your for you when you get married. <laughs> or for your my daughter in law. Or they buy a sari, oh I'm gonna give it away to someone else. And it just keeps on coming in. Knowing that, we shouldn't be like that. Because being a pack rat goes hand in hand with micromanaging, which also Indian parents love to do. Right? I'm sure most of our parents still say, did you eat today? Did you take your coat? Did you have two pairs of shoes? And so on and so forth. Micromanaging is the same as being attached. You now we're trying to be virak purushas. We're trying to inculcate that detachment. So one leads to the other, which leads to the other. I heard a very nice um, acid test to know if something is to be thrown or not. If you don't use something in six months, it's useless to you. Give it to someone who will use it. And I just shared this in Northwest Vienna, and a very smart gentleman came up to me and says, but we live in Chicago, we have seasons. <laughs> and I was like, point noted, you're absolutely right. So then I qualified it, because he was just trying to make an excuse not to throw things out. I said, anything you don't use that's in six months that's not seasonal, needs to go. Think about it. Clothes, shoes, food. Right? Those macaroni and cheese packets or that Mr. Noodle that's sitting there, you know, for month after month after month. Give it to someone who needs it, that will use it. Lots of accountants and business people here. That inventory that's not sold becomes a liability. It's technically on the assets, asset side, but really it's a liability. Because it costs money to keep it there. Same thing goes with our own lives. Remember when I talked about relationships last in January? And I said that friend that doesn't help us to grow is really an enemy at that point. It sounds negative to say enemy, but if they're not helping us to grow, why are we with them then? Why are we investing time and energy and effort with someone who doesn't help us grow? There's six and a half billion people in the world. We can't find someone who will help us grow? Isn't that a better investment then? Well, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we eat symbolizes all that we do in life. 
which is why today we're doing that Sattvic cooking session. Now, the way we eat is the way we think. And I'll tell you a story about this non-covetousness. One day, Lord Brahma, four-faced Brahma, was feeling very generous. So he announced to all the 14 worlds that anyone who comes to me with a vessel of any sort, I will fill it with whatever they want. So all the Rakshasas, all the Devatas, all the, all the Naras, all the women, everyone was delighted and they started lining up to Lord Brahma. People were saying, I want diamonds, people were saying that I want platinum, people were saying I want gold, I want this, I want that. And this one person came with a vessel that had a cloth on it. And he asked Lord Brahma for what he wanted, and Lord Brahma started filling that vessel. And filling it, and filling it, and filling it, and it just wouldn't fill up. So Lord Brahma was getting tired and questioned this individual, what is this vessel that can never be filled? And when he took the cloth off, what was it? A human skull. Meaning, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as Mahatma nicely says, the world has enough for every man's need, but not even one man's greed. The world has enough for every man's need, but not even one man's greed. The human skull is our mind. We lack this santosha, and we, so we keep on trying to get more and more and more. When that more and more and more is on the periphery of that circle that everyone just created. And that what's being lost then is that, that core, that cream, <laughs> that delicious cream in the center of the cake. We keep eating that useless sugary icing. When that cream is there to be eaten. Like a donut, like a Boston cream donut. The donut is the worst part. The cream is what everyone wants. You should just make cream in the donut the whole thing. <laughs> the same thing goes with life. We keep chewing on the, on the periphery and we're missing out on that, that essence. We call it names and forms and ignore the essence. What difference is it? I use a donut as an example. We can use everyday living as an example. Remember this skull story. Remember our wants and needs. Remember Santosha. Remember this Aparigraha. Non-covetousness. <coughs> So we may as well read a shloka <laughs> now, now that we're studying, right? We'll do a review of yesterday. So we'll read shloka 8, 9, and 10 together, and then we will read shloka 11. I'll lead, and everyone can follow. So shloka 8, we will read together. 8, 9, 10. Peda bhavana soma mitya sao bhavana mita bhavani mata Bhavashunya sad, Bhavasustini, Bhavanavada, Bhakti Uttama, Hestalemanas, Swastata Kriya, Bhakti Yoga Bo, Dashanishitam, Bhayurodana, Liyate Manaha, Bhayurodana. Japlapakshiva Rodha Sadhanam Japlapakshiva Rodha Sadhanam Vayurodhana Niyate Manaha Japlapakshiva Rodha Sadhanam What Ramana Maharshi says here is Vayurodhana By restraining the breath, the vayu, the way we breathe Niyate mana, the mind becomes absorbed. How is it absorbed? Jala bakshi, like a cage or a net for a bakshi. Bakshi is a bird. Vat means like. So when I control my breath, my mind is absorbed like a bird is controlled when a cage or a net is put on it. Rodha So this Controlling one's breath is a means of checking the mind. It is a means of controlling or quietening the mind. Is there a relationship between the breath and the mind? If we look to our own lives, 
we would definitively say yes. When we're calm, when we're collected, how is our breathing? It's paced, it's regular, it's slow. When we're angry, our breath speeds up, it becomes irregular. That's why some people have aneurysms, right? That breathing is improper. And that's why when we begin these discourses, I try to emphasize that long only, so that that mind comes down. Because if the mind is quiet, what I say makes more sense. But if the mind's like this, then I, the words are coming, but they keep getting deflected.